So, okay, let's move to the next speaker, which is Mercedes Jimeno Segovia. Uh, you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, she's the Senior Director of Quantum Architecture at PsyQuantum. And she received her PhD from Imperial College of London for her work on linear optical quantum computing architectures. She did uh, her PhD, uh, sorry, her postdocs in Bristol and Calgary and joined PsyQuantum in 2017 and where she led the team working on design and developing architectures for universal photon and quantum computation with uh, silicon uh, photonics. So, and I believe that that's precisely what she will present today. So welcome Mercedes, thank you for joining us and whenever you. you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, yeah, I, I share Sophia's feeling that it's great to have uh, be here among like estimated colleagues and uh, I look forward to the discussions afterwards. Okay, so um, today I want to talk about uh, full tolerant quantum computing with photonics, which is the approach to quantum computing that we are pursuing at Psy Quantum. And in particular, I want to discuss this, uh, these architectures um, in the newly introduced fusion-based quantum computing paradigm, which is the, the computational paradigm that we use um, at Psy Quantum. This is a new framework that is, um, that is focused on the efficient integration of quantum error correction and physical level hardware operations, which is applicable to many platforms for quantum computing, but it's particularly applicable um, to linear optics. Um, so first I want to I wanna get started on why we, why we use photons. So photons have a number of, of very good advantages and here I'm only mentioning a few. Um, particularly is the fact that we can have fast measurement and clock speed. And this fast measurement really allows us to re uh, remove noise from the, from the system early, um, which means that we can unburden our error correction code to be able to um, cope with higher, error, um, higher errors in our hardware. Uh, photons do not um, do not interact, um, in particular when we are in the, the single photon level in, in, in with linear optical operations, and uh, that means that we, we lead to having no cross no quantum crosstalk. Um, and finally, geometrically, photons are not constrained to being in a particular place in space, and actually this is this allows to um, to use this physical scheme to explore higher dimensional. Um, error correcting codes and systems uh, that uh, that really open up new 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 doors for for error correction. Uh, but not only do we use photons, but we also use a particular encoding in photons, which is dual rail. So dual rail is particularly useful because, um, as opposed to single rail, loss is heralded. We detect when it happens, and protecting against heralded errors is much easier. Um, than, than against unheralded errors and we can achieve higher thresholds and we can achieve uh, very clean linear optical operations as well as uh, have a relaxed phase stability requirements. Um, not only do we pursue dual rail photonics but we also pursue it in a, in a physical platform which is silicon photonics. It has a number of advantages uh, for example, we can achieve very low noise thanks to the, the, the really good design and tools that are available to do that. Um, it's an inherently uh, scalable, tem uh, scalable platform because we do not need uh, to have millikelvin temperatures. Um, our photons can connect directly from a silicon photonics chip onto a fiber, an optical fiber, um, the ones that are the same that are um, developed for optical communication. Uh, without the need of transducers and really do we do not need any atomic scale fabrication so all of this really gives us um gives us convinces us that this is a platform that can scale to a full um a full full tolerant quantum computer because the the, the step change from having a few qubits to having hundreds of logical qubits really several orders of magnitude um which are needed for to implement error correcting code Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about how, what are the, how do we encode our qubits, what are the operations before I, I move on to the architecture itself. So we use dual rail photonic qubits um, where we are encoding information in the path degree of freedom. So uh, for every qubit we have two waveguides and if we have like the presence of a photon in the top waveguide is a, corresponds to a logical zero, the presence of a photon in the 
the second waveguide corresponds to a logical one. Now you can see now what I meant about loss being heralded because we are always in the subspace where we have a single photon between two waveguides. So if at any point we detect either more than one photon or less than one photon, then we know that some error has occurred. And in particular with loss, which is our uh, the main source of error for a photonic system, it is heralded in this way. Um, single qubit gates are implemented by um, by 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 doing uh, Maxander interferometers or a generalized version of them. So here we have these uh, directional couplers, um, um, these 50-50 couplers, which are acting as 50-50 beam splitters, um, and how they 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 are they're very simple in the sense that all you're doing is bringing those waveguides. That are doing your um, that are encoding your qubits. You're bringing them close um, together for long enough, such as the field from one of them can evanescently couple to the other one, implementing your beam splitter. Phase shifters uh, can be implemented by a number of different methods. They can be thermal optical, electro optical um, phase shifters, and really the implementation depends on 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 the platform and the, the specification and requirements that you have for for that operation. So single qubit gates can be can be implemented um, very easily, and in fact, there's a there's a, a, a huge volume of literature in 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 silicon photonics implementing and showing how many of these these operations can be done. And in fact, at uh, the you know the the um, the example that Sophia gave on like the first paper on on VQE. Um, implemented as an experiment was done in, in a platform of silicon photonics. Um, two qubit gates are slightly different. So C0 gates um, can be implemented in, in linear optics. Um, and in fact, uh, it was Jeremy O'Brien's group as well, I believe that that showed the first C0 gate with, with a silicon photonics. However, they're not the most natural, um, the most natural two qubit gate for, for photons. And in fact, um, those gates, the more natural gates are what we call fusions. Um, they're more natural because they, they basically consist on, um, on, on some passive interferometer and the simplest one of them, type one fusion, is literally just one beam splitter and two detectors. And um, when we do that, we can, so we can use these operations to do a probabilistic, um, a probabilistic operation on our states. So in this case, for example, we have that um, we have two um, two states, and we put we are putting two of those photons through the gate. Now you will notice that I said qubits have two modes. So here, what I'm doing is I'm taking one mode out of each qubit and, and mixing it here in the interferometer I'm measuring, and a particular detection pattern will herald success. In which case, I will have generated a larger a larger encoded a, a larger um, entangled state. And in some cases, uh, when it fails, when the detection pattern tells me that it's failed, um, I, I get a different, a different state. Now, what is important to note here is that even though my operation may have succeeded or failed, I am still recovering stabilizer operators that describe my state. So all of the outcomes of this uh, fusion gates, they correspond to stabilizer measurements. And the crucial thing is that these stabilizer measurements, they can be used as check operators in a, in a quantum error correcting scheme. And the other thing is that really, I'm putting here an example, but there is a, there is a flexibility on how you choose your passive operations to determine exactly what um, stabilizer operation you're doing on your state. And really, you can start interpreting failure of your gate. For example, in the case of a type two gate, you can interpret the failure of your gate as the erasure of some stabilizer information. And really, erasing stabilizer information is something that error correcting codes are really well prepared to deal with. And then one final note um, is that you 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 see here the simplest um, the simplest uh, entangling gate, which is a passive interferometer followed by some measurement. And this is really the genus of all of the entangling operations that we can that we do in, in linear optics. They are, they are probabilistic because we are in, in the dual rail space. Um, and, and really we can use this same principle applies to many other uh, situations that I'll show you in a second, so that you can build uh, entangled states. 
So for example, we can like the same principle applies of, you know, we create, um, we, we apply a particular interferometer, a passive interferometer, and we do measurement of, um, of a subset of the modes. We can use this principle to generate uh, entangled states, so 3G8 set states um, from single photons. The same principle can be used to get um, gen from these 3G8 set states, combine them in some particular way and generate a larger, more complicated um, entangled state. So you can start building um, what we call resource states, which are small, um, small states of a uh, constant size, be a, few, uh, be a sequence of fusions that you apply to their qubits. Now, it's, it's, it's worth noting that each of these steps is probabilistic. However, it's not, it's not only probabilistic, but it's heralded. So you know, you know not only when it has succeeded or failed, but you also can detect um, errors early because if, for example, imagine that one of the photons here in the left had been lost, um, I have a, I, I have a certain uh, high chance of detecting that, you know, I have a, like a, a different, um, a different number of photons that I was expecting here. Maybe I don't catch it here. Maybe I catch it at the next step where I'm expecting a photon and I don't get it. But this, this sequence of, of, um, of heralded operations really give us information about, um, the errors and, um, and what we can do is whenever the operation fails or we detect an error, we can switch out. Um, the state so we can do multiplexing, which basically means we repeat an operation uh, several times and we select the one that has um, that has succeeded. The, only, the other important point is that um, this leads to only constant overhead, which means that to generate a particular resource state, we only need to, you, you, we will need to generate a, a constant number of extra photons and have extra resources. Um, and this probabilistic nature of the operations, because we are using multiplexing, uh, does not lead to any exponential scaling. And, you know, this is a question that comes up often. And, and actually, this is the, the basis uh, of the original KLM architecture that was proposed in 2001, showing that linear optical quantum computing was indeed feasible. But now from go going, we need to go to from feasible to something that is practical. So we have been at Psyquantum, we have been working on um, full tolerant architectures that are motivated by photonics. And really the goal for us is to achieve full tolerance using the uh, natively photonic operations. And there are different, um, different aspects that we have been focusing on. Um, first is reduced classical processing. So previous architectures for linear optical quantum computer require a lot of steps of quite complex classical processing, particularly those architectures that use percolation and that meant that we, while that computation was occurring, our, our photons were stored in fiber and they were waiting and they were subjected to loss. So that's something that we wanted to remove. Um, we also wanted to have photons that have a very short, short word line. That means that the number of components since the moment that that photon is born in a, in a source until the moment that is um, absorbed at a detector, we want that to be the minimal possible so that there's a very small amount of errors that are accumulated through the life of the photon. Most importantly, we want that that word line does not depend on the algorithm that we are implementing or the error correcting code is itself so that as we scale the computer, as we run different algorithms, that photonic word line remains constant. And finally, uh, modularity is key to in order to build large systems. Um, you know, we can build maybe one bespoke large system, but really when we are going into something where we want to be able to expand, um, expand to like increase the, the, the size or increase the capabilities, um, modularity is, um, is really key. So that's one of the things that we are focusing as well. So, um, with, with all that, um, the, we, we recently, the, we have been working on this uh, new full tolerant framework for quantum computing for a while, and we published um, a paper uh, recently in January on the, on the archive on, on this topic. So um, if you're interested, I'll, like a lot more detail than what I'm gonna talk about are gonna be in that paper. And the interesting thing about this framework is that even though it was inspired by photonics because that was the particular platform we were working in. It's really generally, general, generally applicable. So um, the, the, 
this framework has some primitives. So one of the, the first primitive is a resource state, which are um, small entangled states of a few qubits. And um, these resource states, they have a constant. So for one particular um, architecture, they will have constant size and they are always we 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 are focusing on them being uh, stabilized states mainly because stabilized states are um, much easier to um, not to deal with but a lot of the error correcting codes that exist that, that are well studied are um, use a stabilizer formalism the other uh, important thing that i will emphasize a little bit later is that because they are small the amount of error that can have been accumulated on the generation of that state really is um, is usually low, but most importantly, is is constrained. And secondly, we have uh, fusion measurements, which are projective entangled measurements that I have shown you already. And usually, they give us, two, you know, because they are projective entangled measurements, they give us a number of bits. So you can think of they can be multi-parted, um, uh, multi-parted, but uh, the the easiest and most useful. Um, these are as more useful schemes have uh, fusion measurements of two qubits, so equivalent uh, to L measurements, and they give two measurement bits, um, which are the stabilizers x, x, and z, z. For example, if those have been chosen to be like that, and the measurements now can be um, erased, so we may lack that information, um, or they may, may be flipped because they have um, we we may have have a a, a Pauli error, and the like those measurements. Um, are then like the outcome of those measurements are treated as part of our error correcting code. So once we take that, so we have resource states and fusion measurements, and then we have a fusion network, which basically describes um, a particular structure in which resource states are fused together according to um, um, a certain rules. And now this does not necessarily mean that this is like spatially or temporally, like this is more abstract, but then it's easier to translate into kind of a space time um, paradigm. Now, the structure of this fusion network is really designed such that the outcomes that um, of those of those projective entangled measurements are so. So we are doing the entangling measurements. We are create which create this long range entanglement across this lattice. But at the same time, they are providing the outcomes that we need um, in order to compute the check operators of the error correcting code that is that is implemented. And now you can see here why it's, it's really interesting that we have very small constant size resource states because you know we have a small constant size resource states which means that any errors that have been any correlated errors across any of those resources that have been generated are really constrained to one part of the uh, one part of the um, of the lattice and they do not expand across um, entire entire blocks which might be, become uh, logical qubits so you know, we call it FBQC, fusion-based quantum computing. It's very reminiscent of MBQC, so I want to quickly make a disambiguation to to clarify. So, so there's there's three main differences um, between MBQC and FBQC. First is that in measurement-based quantum computing, the resource state that is prepared, it has a size that is dependent on the algorithm. You want to run a longer algorithm, you need a bigger state. You want to add more qubits, you need a bigger state. Whereas for fusion-based quantum computing, the size of my resource state keeps, uh, remains the same. If I want to run a longer algorithm or if I want to have more qubits, I need to add more states, not bigger states. And that really makes a difference um, in terms of the, you know, the correlation of errors and the resources that you, need, that you require. Secondly, is that in measurement-based quantum computing, the measurements are single qubits, whereas for fusion-based are two qubits. And, um, the third one is that fault tolerance in MBQC is kind of an add-on that you add on top of your cluster state generation. There are two independent processes, whereas in fusion base really is that your error correcting code is like that its structure is encoded in the structure of the fusion network. So you use it to, to build it. OK, so um, I'm going to show you one example of an MBQC scheme. This is what is appears in with one of the examples that we give in the paper. So for example, one, one um, and this is the best performing one out of, out of the ones that we show. So you can have a resource state, which in this case is a, is a ring of uh, six qubits. So this is a graph state representation, but you have, um, those are the stabilizers that describe it. And the fusions is gonna be very simple. It's just a bell, bell measurement. So then the network is a, per, you know, you, 
each you you describe it as a, as a unit cell so each unit cell is going to have two so the ones that are highlighted in purple two of these resource states and then we're going to be doing uh, fusions with the neighboring cells according to this um to this rule so you you know you can imagine that really your your full computation happens by like the tiling of many of these of these blocks and finally you have a decoding scheme which is related to your network so the decoding scheme is described here as a syndrome graph which is then what is decoded by minimum weight perfect matching union finder whichever decoder that you want to use where now you have that uh, the vertices represent the parity checks of your code and the um, and, and and they have incident many edges and then the edges of the wrap of the graph represent the single fusion measurement outcomes so by you know this is this basically tells you what is the data structure that you need to process in order to tell if there has been an error in your qubit or not now um so far i have been telling you a lot of the microscopics about how do we correct errors at the physical level but really you know what we want to know is in order to do quantum computation we want to do some logic so logic really requires us to look at, at the macroscopic features the topological features of the graph that we that we are um that we are building and for example here i have a, a very simple example whereby creating a, some specific graph and, and smooth boundaries we can create an identity gate now i don't have time to go into the details of this but um, there's a paper coming up from coming out from our from our group which describes this in a lot more detail. Okay, so so far I've been telling you um, about the you know the photonic architecture for for FVQC and this has so far become kind of very abstract. Um, so in order for to help to visualize it a little bit, I want to show you some um, kind of the, the like how it might look like in terms of the physical architecture. So you can imagine you know in in time. You can imagine that each of these resource states, like you're you're generating layers of them, and then you're you're entangling them with their neighbors, and some of them you're keeping them alive to the next round. So something like this, right? Like so, you're generating these resource states, and then they're generated, they're immediately measured, and that's it, right? So in a sense, you can see that really we have achieved this this um, this goal of having a very short um, time um, more line for our photons. So you have like this, these states being generated, they've been fused between their neighbors, some of them are remaining a lot, some of the qubits are remaining alive long enough to measure with the neighbor that comes at a time step one after so that we can create really entanglement across the space um, and, and time. So we are using time as a third dimension of our code. So in terms of what that means for an architecture, it means that we have um, some resource state generators which are on, on a clock um, generating states, then they go into a network that basically takes the right states to the right fusion network, uh, the, 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 the right neighbors to be fused to, and some of them have delays so that we, we, can, um, we can fuse with the previous time step. We have a number of fusions, and then those fusions, um, they can perform reconfigurable measurements in order to be able to implement logic. And then finally, the output of those measurements go to a classical processor. Basically, this classical processor is uh, in charge of both receiving the information, processing it, decoding it, as well as sending the fusion device settings so that we can implement some algorithm. Now, um, I think something interesting here is that you can see that it's completely decoupled the, the time scale on that, that the, my resource state generators are, 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 being, are producing resource states is completely decoupled from this like um, top classical processor because it doesn't need to be sending a lot of information and that's, that's really helpful once you start thinking about the, um, the classical processing architecture. Now, so far I have been telling you a little bit about the physical architecture, but I have not covered at all anything about the error analysis, methodology, etc. So in the paper we cover this and there's a number of, um, of graphs and a particular toy example, like sorry, with a toy error model where we do the full calculation. But really this, you know, in order we are we're working towards building one such device. And um, in order to do that, toy models are not enough. So what we have been uh, developing is a multi-scale numerical model that allows us to capture over 25 sources of errors, um, errors that in components and trace their, their impact all the way through logical gates. 
So the way we do it is that we start with some FDTD simulation verified models of our individual hardware devices, such as the directional coupler that I told you about. This, uh, these models feed into second quantized simulation of specific circuits, for example, bell state generation or fusion, which then uh, in turn, these feed into tensor network simulations of large layouts of resource state generation, for example, um, which then progress into capturing entire fusion networks. And finally, um, we go all the way up to decoding entire logical gates um, that are built from these fusion networks. Now, this has been the work of, um, of, of, of the entire architecture team. Uh, it's been like over, over two years of work, but really it allows us to calculate the, the, the impact that you know, the change in the lineage roughness of our directional coupler or the change in efficiency of like one source or one detector has at the level of the logical, um, of the logical performance of our computer. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up. I just want to like remind you of the key concepts that we covered, which were we, we talked about the implementation of the linear optical quantum computing primitives with silicon photonics, in particular these fusion gates, which are the more natural entangling gates for photonics. Um, I told you about this, this new framework for uh, of fusion-based quantum computing that is in that paper that I'm, I'm referencing here at the bottom of the slide. And finally, we talked a little bit as, as well about the physical architecture, like how does it look like once you take this abstract concept and this abstract framework and try to turn it into an actual device. And with that, um, thank you very much. And let me know if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Very interesting. Uh, OK, I can see already many uh, hands raised. So uh, let me check. Please, Ali Reza, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. You may mention the answer, but I anyway want to ask again. I was thinking about, for example, a chemistry problem. Of course, when we have a more complicated ansatz, we need a we need a deeper circuit. So the probability of success reduced. But later you said that in FPQC we have a size independent. Uh, I mean. The circuit should be size independent. We have a fixed size, but we have to introduce more state. I was wondering if having more states reintroduced the problem we have for the uh, for the success probability, because for each state we have this probability to get the success. Um, uh, no, uh, in, and in fact, whenever we we are doing simulations of of this, so what, like you know this this kind of full stack of simulation that I that I showed here. Um, really, we, we are taking in like multiple resource states with their with the probabilities that each of them are generated and um, and simulate entire fusion networks and their performance. So this this problem is um, yeah it's it's not reintroduced. I think uh, let me just mention like kind of related to your question, which is um, here like all all that I have been talking about is full tolerant quantum computing, which means that I am building logical entire logical gates. So um, if I want to run a particular chemistry algorithm, what I would do is take that algorithm, um, I would compile it, right? So I will break it down into, the, the, into a, a set of gates that are the ones that we implemented, and then we would implement those gates. So, um, and that, that's you know, something that I've not been talking about. We have a, at PsyQuantum, we have an applications team that actually um, does in a sense the top end of the stack. So here I've stopped the logical gates, but we have a team that is able to go and say, take a take a quantum chemistry algorithm, for example, and then break it down into the into primitives, do compilation, you know, if and then like with you know taking into account what are the logical error rates that we want to be um, that we want to be achieving, we can trace that all the way down all the way down and tell exactly how good my resource states need to be, and like we can estimate from that a like what would be the size of the machine that we that we need to be running for how long would it be running for example time is something that i have not spoken about which is you know there's there's, a, there's always a trade-off i can do more things in parallel or more things in sequence but there, there's a trade-off with the timing um that yeah that's 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 a whole other story that i've not covered mm -hmm. Thank you. so you don't need uh to measure for each estate separately um no so it uh, each state separately it's uh so in a sense you can imagine that you have 
multiple resource state generators that are each of them doing independent thing at the same time. You can also imagine generating that network by having the same resource state generator generate multiple copies of your resource state. And actually that is an idea that we um, explore much further in, um, in another paper that came out last month, which is, um, I think it's called Interleaving Modular Architectures for Photon and Quantum Computing. Um, that, you can, that you can take a look at, maybe that would be useful. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but uh, please stay connected because we will continue the discussions, but just stop the recording. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you uh, to Sofia and Mercedes for these really interesting talks and see you everyone to the next QSD. Thank you very much. And there was a question in the chat, so I will just make sure everyone knows. Please follow us on Twitter or subscribe in Eventbrite if you don't want to miss uh, the next um, seminar. And I believe me, you don't want to miss the next one. Okay, <laughs> so thank you very much. I stopped recording.